Major funding for In Your Neighborhood, New Brunswick has been provided by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, working with others to build a national culture of health, enabling everyone in America to live longer, healthier lives. New Jersey's Hub City, a crossroads where classic art stands side by side with state-of-the-art medical facilities, where a building boom complements the historic Rutgers University campus. New Brunswick, we're in your neighborhood. Hello, I'm Mary Alice Williams. We're broadcasting tonight from Brother Jimmy's Barbecue in New Brunswick, a city planted smack in the middle of what colonists called the King's Highway. It had Queen's College, and ever since, people from princes to paupers have been drawn here, and tonight we'll show you why. Michael Hill has the story of the institution that started it all. When you look at New Brunswick, you see a city indelibly shaped by Rutgers University, chartered in 1766 before the American Revolution as Queen's College. The institution later became Rutgers University, named after Colonel Henry Rutgers. It was New Jersey's land-grant institution. Rutgers New Brunswick Chancellor David Dutta insists Rutgers will live up to its obligation. We are here to serve the public. We are a public higher education. We are a land-grant institution. We oftentimes forget that. We take it for granted because it's been so long. It's been 155 years. In total, Rutgers contributes $350 million to the greater New Brunswick economy by its 40,000 students, 10,000 faculty members, and hundreds of thousands of visitors. And it goes beyond just an economic impact on the city. Hundreds of Rutgers students volunteer hundreds of thousands of hours at places like Youth Empowerment Services, among them Ishan Call, who learned of the need from a Rutgers involvement fair. There's something about these kids that really want, that really make you want to really reach their potential. Barry Smith opened the doors in downtown New Brunswick 15 years ago amid four Rutgers campuses. Well, we're seeing kids uh, advance to the next grade level where some of them would not have without our help. Call has a full load in his pre-med studies in Honors College. He's a junior accepted into the Robert Wood Johnson Medical School to study becoming a pediatrician the next four years. But he took on another challenge last year when he discovered a major gap in what students should know. With Smith's direction, Call and his Honors College classmates founded a tutoring, mentoring, practical life skills after-school program called A to E. It's for first, second, and third graders at Roosevelt Elementary. There's more to life than just math and reading. And we really want to teach our kids um, anything from you know empathy and teamwork to, to STEM, and we kind of have activities and games built in to try and teach them that. Dutta says that giving back fulfills a major mission. To give students the real experience of fulfillment and to give the residents an understanding of why Rutgers is really on a daily basis impacting lives. Dutta says of the 14 Big Ten Conference schools, Rutgers has the highest number of in-state students at 83 percent and is the most diverse, a cause he championed as Purdue University provost and insists on for Rutgers. To answer why that's important, Dutta quotes John Dewey's democracy in education from a hundred years ago. Whether we let chance environments do the work or whether we design environments for the purpose makes a big difference. The university recently opened a new dormitory on College Avenue, honoring famed abolitionist Sojourner Truth, making a conscious effort to recognize its colonial and slave past while looking toward the future. Without recognizing its past, without understanding the positives and the negatives of the past, our education is incomplete. Dutta is an engineer who left his native India in the early 80s for American higher education. He wants students to never stop dreaming. It's the poverty of aspiration that I refuse to accept. One of the chancellor's new challenges is changing the reputation of Rutgers. People within New Jersey take Rutgers for granted. Ah, you go to Indiana, Rutgers. Go to California, even more. So the farther you go, the reputation rises. On the banks of the The local hospital here has a growing reputation. Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital has a statewide reach on its way to becoming a healthcare giant. 
President and CEO John Gantner joins Brianna Vernozzi. Bree? He does. John, as we sit here, we're just a stone's throw away from RWJ University yeah, Hospital. I, I walked here in two minutes. It's a little yeah. cold for that, but, it is a little but you cold. did it. Yeah. So how do you keep the healthcare local for the New Brunswick community now being a part of the state's largest healthcare system, yeah. that being RWJ, Barnab RWJ and Barnabas right. Health? Well, you're absolutely right. Healthcare is local. And um, I actually started at Robert Wood back in 1993, and at that time, we believed healthcare was local. And to this day, we believe and we know that healthcare is local. Interestingly, the merger does not threaten that dynamic. So if you were to look at the mission statement of Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, it's to improve the healthcare of the people and the communities that we serve. If you were to look at the mission statement for RWJ Barnabas Health, it's to improve the health of the communities that we serve. So they're nearly identical. So I would argue that the merger actually acts as an accelerant to our pursuit of community benefit and serving the missions that all 11 hospitals in the RWK Barnabas Health System serve. And, and that is often the worry, yeah, that, that the merger can create such a large system that you have some of those issues. So what can you point to as some of the benefits then from that, that merger? Uh, the benefits associated with the merger probably fall into three or four different categories. Some are tactical, some are strategic. So uh, one of the immediate benefits, and it's in the tactical category, would be cost savings. So there was a target when these two giants came together to save $120 million of spending. Uh, and most of that is in purchasing supplies and equipment. And actually, to date, that number has been exceeded. It's about 2% of the $5 billion operating budget of the combined organization. Eventually, that 2% will make its way into the cost of health care for the consumers. So one is the efficiencies, the economies of scale that go along with bringing two large organizations together. Okay. On the strategic side, um, I would say it's around dealing with and anticipating the changes in the healthcare marketplace. I want to, I want to talk to you about one other alliance that's happened. Sure. That's with Rutgers. And there was a, a new system announced just this past July. Tell us about that. What does that entail and what is this going to provide for our students who are here? And some of them are in here right now tonight. Uh, okay. We could talk about three hours about uh, what the merger between okay, how about 30, seconds? 30 seconds <laughs> will be a little trickier, but, but we can do it. Um, so Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital since the mid-70s has been a major teaching hospital, is an academic health center. The relationship with Rutgers is a deeper version of an integration between a medical school and a hospital. So it will allow us to do what we do today uh, to a higher level. But I think the benefits to the Robert Wood Johnson Barnabas Health System are deeper because the other 10 hospitals in the system don't have as much academics as Robert Wood does. They will now have more academics. So there's some room for expansion there's there. There's room for expansion. And academics, we believe, lifts quality, lifts, lifts the spectrum of services that the hospitals offer. So I think uh, tremendous benefit through the system and benefits to Rutgers. We'll stop you there, John Gantner. Okay. Thank you so much, and uh, we appreciate it. I have something for you. Oh, my goodness. Because it is the holiday season, uh, some Robert Wood Johnson hey, holiday candy. hospitals giving so. out chocolate. That's not something that you see very often. <laughs> you can have it. You can clap, but it's mine. <laughs> Mary Alice, we're going to send it back to you. Thanks Thank you so much, me. John. Yeah. We appreciate it. Okay. Stay right there for us. Right yeah. Thanks, Brianna. By contrast, there's another community here that seldom makes the headlines. People living off the grid and out of sight, homeless and in need of help. Leah Mishkin has their story. See, now this is a hole in the fence. There's you know a what hole that means? in the fence. And our that shoes. Somebody, somebody comes up through here yeah. and somebody possibly oh, could be living fence. up in there. Really cold outside. Okay. How they don't? How do they keep? Yeah. There's tricks to staying warm. Yeah. I was homeless once. The trick was newspaper. Robert Mason says he spent a year and a half living on the street because he didn't want to tell his family he had an addiction to drugs. That was over a decade ago. He did ultimately go to his grandmother's house and got help. You'd be surprised. Family will take people back if they admit their wrongs. That's just one aspect. The other yeah. aspect is you have individuals that are suffering from mental illness. We were asked not to say where we are, but through this tunnel is a spot where many homeless people sleep, a place hidden away from police where nobody can bother them. And they're going to go speak to them because they just want to make sure they're okay with our cameras being here. They don't want to be filmed, but they just don't want to be interviewed. 
Robert and Marisol both work for the Heart Team at Elijah's Promise. They find out where homeless people are living and go there to pass out food and any hygiene items. By going every week, the team is building trust in the hope of getting people into their office to begin getting them the help they need. Do some boxes. You know, I, was I might have some briefs. <laughs> I might not have boxes, but I got briefs. <laughs> but you got to come see me. I got. I have. All righty. You're at 2 o'clock. All righty. You're at 2 o'clock. I'll be there. All right. So we're heading to our second stop. Yes. Look right over here. A lot of these faces that we gonna, that we see now do come to the soup kitchen. They do come to eat. Elijah's Promises Community Kitchen in New Brunswick serves almost 300 meals a day. On today's menu, soup, salad, roasted potatoes, and chicken fresh out of the oven. John and Ken met at a homeless shelter. They call this place a godsend because they know they can get a hot meal and escape the cold weather. You gotta find a way to survive. And let me say this, he, he, these gentlemen are always looking for work. They're not sitting on their behinds yeah. doing nothing. At the end of the day, it's survival. Plus you have responsibilities. I pay child support. I have you know, stuff I have to pay for. I mean, believe me, I'd rather have a roof over my head and be warm every night, but my child has to eat. The homeless population is on the decline in New Jersey, but here in Middlesex County, it's gone up by 19 percent compared to last year. I, I think homelessness is rising, uh, unfortunately. Um, in New Brunswick, I would like to say that we have become somewhat of a victim of our own success. This city official explained that all their resources are attracting more homeless people to the city. New Brunswick alone, we have the only two uh, uh, shelters for women of domestic violence, victims of domestic violence. Uh, we have a men's rotating shelter, which is 15 beds alone. Our cold blue program, which I coordinate, uh, we house maybe 45 in one location, and we have four locations. One of the oldest historic structures in the city is a shelter during the coldest parts of winter. They literally cram them in as close as possible simply because there are so many people who need to come in, need to have some place where they're not going to freeze to death. This is one city that is, is willing to do something. There's such a big demand. Sadly, that, that is very true. You said you work for the county, though. You said you had a business, so it just puts real, you know, it happens yeah, to anyone. It's and anybody. Anybody can be in any moment. Any true. Exactly. It breaks your heart even just sitting at a table with those two homeless men. Right. You know, we're, we can stop rolling and we go back to our homes, but then you still think about those two people. I people walking by the homeless as if they're not there. I can understand why they would feel like they were forgotten or they, they feel were feel less than. Right. Less than. And then when you got some people like ourselves who show them that you're more than. Mm -hmm. Not less than, you're more than. Mm -hmm. They're worthy. That's the bond right there. Yep. That's the bond. Now to the global community impact of pharmaceutical giant Johnson & Johnson. The company was founded here back in 1886 and has played a key role in growing this city. Johnson & Johnson's Global Director for Social Business Practices on the company's Global Community Impact Team is Sean Mickus, who joins Michael Aaron. Michael? Mary Alice, Sean Mickus has been with J&J, &J, he says, for about 20 years. How would you describe the relationship between the company and New Brunswick? I would say it's been a long uh, historical relationship. We've been in New Brunswick for about 131 years, and since the beginning, um, we're one of only a handful of companies, I think, globally that is still on their uh, founding site. And in the 1970s, we made a, a commitment to rebuild our corporate headquarters in the city. And from that moment on, it's um, we, we kind of doubled down on the city and help to form uh, the uh, New Brunswick Development Corporation, uh, New Brunswick Tomorrow, and the New Brunswick Cultural Center. And those are kind of three pillars when you think about community revitalization and development that can help to uh, have an impact in the city that's so diverse. Why did J&J &J begin in New Brunswick? So it started actually on a train ride um, 
our one of our founders was uh, taking a train from New, New York to Philadelphia, and there was a stop in New Brunswick, and he saw a sign in a wallpaper factory that said "Factory for Rent," and he was looking for a location, and he got off the train, and the rest is history, as they say. So we, we've we've always loved that New Brunswick. Was General Johnson. Was no, it? no, that was uh, that was uh, his dad. His dad. His dad. Yes. Um, what role? does the company play in the city today? Sure. So um, we've always, uh, because of our uh, value system, um, we've always supported the communities where we live and work, and that's critically important to us. And so we really focus in three areas, health, education, and community livability. And so we have uh, several dozen partnerships with many organizations in the city. We partner very directly with the city of New Brunswick. In fact, I was with Mayor Cahill today. Um, we, and I can give you a few examples, if you like, of, of opportunities that, um, and partnerships that we've had. So with Rutgers University, as an example, we partner with them on, on multiple different levels. So when you think about health, uh, we work with the Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School and support the efforts at, that they're doing at the Chandler Health Center in town, where they're providing preventative care to over 6,000 uh, children and women each year. And so that's an example from a health perspective, looking at healthier New Brunswick. When you think about education, uh, we have programs um, where we do a Saturday Scholars program where we're providing SAT preparation for uh, students, juniors and seniors in the New Brunswick high school system. Um, and then when you think from a community livability perspective, we've done a number of uh, partnerships with the Blaustein School and with the city of New Brunswick looking at park assessments, food assessments, and looking at food insecurity issues. All right, Sean Mickus, thanks for giving us that thumbnail sketch of a long-standing relationship. Thank Mary you. Alice, back to you. Thank you, Michael. Alongside long-established corporations like Johnson & Johnson, small businesses are gaining traction here, fueled by a growing community of immigrants with ideas and the moxie to realize them. David Cruz has that story. This is La Brega, the six days a week, put your eight to ten hours in schedule that defines life for many in New Brunswick's Latino community. Latinos are almost 60% of the population here, putting New Brunswick among the top cities in the state for percentages of Latinos. In 2000, the Census Bureau reported a Latino population of just over 39%. That number grew to almost 50% in 2010, and the latest census data shows that number at 55.8 percent. I came here in 2007. Angelica Jimenez has six children, ranging from toddler to college age. Her husband works two jobs, and she does small jobs, including selling handmade crocheted hats and gloves. Life in New Brunswick beats the struggles in Oaxaca, where Angelica's from, but she knows the challenges her husband and other immigrant workers face here every day. Sometimes the bosses don't want to pay for sick days or not pay for days that they do work. Sometimes they say they didn't keep track of the days. They work five days and the boss wants to pay them for three, right? Exactly. They steal the wages. We met Angelica at Unity Square, the home base of a Catholic charities nonprofit whose staff provides language classes, immigration assistance, and other services for this community. Ojilvia Jose stops by here almost every weekday. She's raising five little ones, aged 5 through 11, on her own. For her, raising them is her full-time job. Exactly. I talk with them all the time about how life over there is really difficult. And over here, they have every chance to get ahead, to study for everything. If you want to see and feel the economic and cultural impact that Latinos are having in New Brunswick, all you have to do is take a walk on French Street. Restaurants, salons, and other professional services, Latin-owned and operated, often started by immigrants who, for any number of reasons, were shut out from some of the other jobs in otherwise booming New Brunswick. Latinos, we start opening businesses, cash-based businesses, like restaurants, beauty salons, barber shops, bodegas. Those are the more common, uh, and the main reason is those are the ones who require less capital investment. And because we don't have access to capital, we try to start businesses that doesn't require a lot of money to, to start. 
De La Hoz says the Latino business community here is evolving. Part of his job is to help them find capital, build networks, and most importantly, access new markets. We have been in New Brunswick for a long time, right? But the reality is that um, since the financial crisis, we start more businesses than any other ethnic group. And moving beyond bodegas is what the chamber wants to encourage. Las Marias, co-owned by Maria Nieves, is an example of a local Mexican restaurant with broad ambitions. When she started in the restaurant business 17 years ago, traditional Mexican ingredients, even to make tortillas, were hard to come by. Today, packaged tortillas are everywhere. But for handmade tortillas, you got to come to places like Las Marias, where non-Latinos are the fastest growing client base. We're trying to market and get the word out about products from our different countries. So today, it's easy to taste something from Colombia, Venezuela, El Salvador, and above all else, something Mexican. This is a community that continues to grow in numbers and in sophistication. Progress can be slow, but the spirit here is indomitable. And the future for both the city and this community is bright. One of Rutgers' lasting legacies gave Meals on Wheels new meaning, the grease trucks. Once had more fame than the football team. Brenda Flanagan gives us a taste. It starts with marinara sauce on a roll. Add some chicken fingers, layer on a few deep-fried mozzarella sticks, then stack french fries on the top. The gut-busting result? A 1,700-plus calorie sandwich famously called a Fat Daryl. It's my favorite. Why? I don't know. It's just a good combination. Like, it just, just goes right down. The Fat Daryl's named after its creator, former Rutgers student Daryl Butler. 20 years ago, the ravenous Daryl couldn't afford 12 bucks for the individual ingredients, so he talked the owner of Are You Hungry, one of Rutgers' legendary grease trucks, into cramming them all into a roll for one-third the price. I was a standard with my friends eating my, you know, my creation and celebrating my victory, but I sat there and watched this. Literally 50 people ordered the exact same thing that I got. Within an hour, it became the top seller. Its fame spread by word of mouth, you might say. In 2004, Maxim dubbed the Fat Daryl best sandwich in the country. I was just trying to get a cheap meal. I didn't expect this to take off and be a thing. You know, I know students don't have that much money. I don't want to make them happy. And I know they like to eat, so I'll make it big. Are You Hungry owner Eamon El Nagar says hordes of hungry students used to chow down at nine grease trucks that squatted along College Avenue. From the 1980s on, they fed the Rutgers community hot, greasy, fast food 24-7. And after Daryl, the fat sandwich menu exploded. Students created new versions, and kids who could eat five fats in 45 minutes got to name one. Grease trucks spawned a culture. The grease trucks were a staple when we came up here for sports games. You went to the grease trucks. And the grease trucks were literally the heart and soul of the campus. At that time, that was that was the spot to go. Like after parties or even before classes, everybody hung out in these trucks. And the trucks commanded a cultish foodie following that extended far beyond campus. People used to come from everywhere, Philadelphia, New York, everywhere. But but it was a lot. It was a mess. It was. It was a beautiful atmosphere. But Rutgers claimed the trucks also created a nuisance, attracting noisy, sometimes nasty late-night party animals and pumping out noxious exhaust smoke. Their numbers dwindled as Rutgers ordered them to move twice until only one remained. Are you hungry? El Nagar cried when Rutgers finally banned his trailer. I had my family with me and my kids. I just couldn't stop it. I didn't believe it. And it was a very sad feeling that I don't want to remember it. Rutgers launched its own non-grease truck substitutes, one's a mobile Starbucks, one of only six nationwide. This is a full-service truck, so we have everything here. We still have the gluten-free, we still have the vegan uh, options here, the pastries. I don't know, I feel like the grease trucks were kind of a local thing that we were known for versus Starbucks, which is kind of... I bougie, I guess. <laughs> Rutgers also fielded the Night Wagon in 2013, their dining service on wheels, which offers a long list of options with a lot of healthy alternatives. The wagon's top seller, the Skirted Night. Which is skirt steak marinated in balsamic vinaigrette 
and it's served with sautéed onions, peppers, mushrooms, topped with blue cheese, and it's served on a toasted ciabatta roll, and it's finished off with a pesto mayo. Not a fat sandwich, but are you hungry? Didn't die. El Nagar opened a bricks and mortar restaurant on the same lot where his trailer used to sit. The menu's even been updated with vegetarian options. You know, I love what I do, and I do it from my heart. If you my customer, you'll know. The night wagon's nice, but the original still rocks. This is a fat veggie Indian. It's got falafel, French fries, uh, mozzarella, marinara. Phil has got the original Daryl. Clink. I'm Brenda Flanagan. I'm taking a bite. up our final In Your Neighborhood edition for 2017. I came over here to get Breezy's chocolate. Ate it already. Thank you so much to Brother Jimmy's Barbecue, to our studio audience to hear the people of New Brunswick have been great. We'll see you tomorrow. to build a national culture of health, enabling everyone in America to live longer, healthier lives.